Um, thanks for the for the organizer to to invite me here for this uh, for this meeting. Uh, uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to uh, to imaging, and so uh, as was hinted before, uh, imaging is becoming a, a very uh, challenging uh, field for storage, also I guess. Um, so I'm a group leader at the BioHub uh, in San Francisco, and so what we do is we build um, uh, light sheet microscopes, which are uh, these devices that let you observe a, a living organism. Um, in its totality over time, so you can really uh, obs observe a developing embryo at cellular resolution without trouble, and that of course produces a lot of data. And so I'm going to going to to talk now about uh, two main uh, topics, which are essentially how do you build these machines so that they are actually be able to able to to do adaptive imaging, but also how we used machine learning to improve the quality of the images coming from the microscopes. So what is light sheet microscopy? So light sheet microscopy is essentially a new modality of imaging. It's I mean, it's like you know, almost 15 years old now, but it's it's uh, it's a very uh, powerful technique because it lets you observe an entire living system, like a, here uh, a, a zebrafish uh, larva. Um, and so the way it works is we generate sheets of light with. Uh, illumination objectives and by scanning a laser beam up and down here and then we observe the light coming out of this sample the fluorescence light because we, we modify these, these organisms to be fluorescent so we label for example the nuclei um, with GFP and then we observe the light coming out of these specimens uh, using uh, detection objectives and so um, you can have uh, the simplest situation you can have one illumination one detection objective you can have here, as, as depicted here, you can have three such objectives, or you can have four with two elimination and two detection objectives. And so the great thing about this is that it's, the imaging is fast, it's very gentle, there's little, little, very little light uh, that's needed to, to image the sample, so you don't kill the sample, you don't bleach the, the fluorophores. And it's also volumetric, so we get, by scanning this plane, uh, this illuminated plane here, the light sheet and the detection plane of the detection objective together, we can get very rapidly, rapidly a, 3D, uh, a 3D image every, uh, the fastest it can go probably is in the order of, of several per second in some setups. And so once you have, of course, a, a, a machine that can measure, that's great, but then ideally you want to, to visualize that and um, uh, in the ideal case you want to visualize that in real time so that we can see instantly in 3D and rotate a sample on the screen, and so you, we actually can do that with the, with the latest technology we have uh, developed. Um, and uh, if you can do this visualization in real time, it also means you can also process the, the image data in real time uh, and do all sorts of things uh, with that. But the, that affords you a unique opportunity, which is to adapt the microscope in real time so that we can push the uh, resolution of these systems to the to their limit. Um, so that now the microscope is, is not just a, a, a static uh, machine that will take images, it's, uh, it's an adaptive system that uh, uh, tracks and, and adjusts itself automatically to the sample. Um, if, uh, and then going forward, uh, we, want to, uh, we have uh, developed some <coughs> machine learning algorithms to improve the quality of the images and then going forward we will have that running in real time also on, this, on the microscopes. So um, I will discuss so I will not talk so much about uh, something that uh, uh, has been quite popular in the field, which is the th uh, 3D visualization, both offline and, and in real time on the microscopes. Instead, we'll focus on, on these two projects, the autopilot and the, and the care project. Um, so the autopilot project is essentially how to turn these uh, fancy large microscopes into self-driving uh, uh, microscopes. Um, this is the data you can produce with these microscopes. So this is. Uh, um, actually 3D data, this is just a, a, a front projection. Um, we have here 21 hours of recording every 30 seconds. This is total, total 2,500 time points, a total of terabytes, so that's a terabyte a day. Um, so when discussing with Jim Karnakias, who is at the BioHub, the person that is uh, you know, the, 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 the vice president and, and the leader of the, of the, the, the team, the, the data science team, you know, <laughs> our discussions are oftentimes in like the terabytes and petabyte scale, and how do we, you know, how do we make sure that these things, uh, that, the, that the machines we're gonna uh, build are actually capable of, uh, of storing, I mean, where, the question is where do we store all this data, right? So, so there's clearly a, a challenge there. And, and here, so, um, uh, 
the, the, the key th interesting thing here is also that our data, because of the adaptivity of the microscopes, uh, we have a very uh, fine exquisite, exquisite resolution, so we can we have nearly a cellular, cellular resolution throughout the embryo um, over multiple of hours. And so the question is, how do you how do you achieve this image quality? And it turns out that inside of uh, so the way we image these samples in, uh, is inside of a, a, a agarose gel. So we put the specimen in agarose matrix. We eliminate that with the light sheet. And we have a, a variety of, uh, of refractive indices that uh, bend the light and, and uh, that enters or leaves the sample. And so this conspires to degrade the, ima the image quality dramatically in some cases. Um, these variations of refractive indices also happen within the sample and or are not only spatially variant, but also temporally variant, uh, which further complicates the, 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 the imaging task. In the case of a multicolor recording, you have uh, possibly the problem that this, the one channel will not be expressed at the very beginning of the rec recording, so you cannot adjust the microscope in advance. So you cannot guarantee at the beginning of the recording that, the, for example, this spaniel marker that's labeling all the, the cells in the CNS will be sharp and, and well resolved. And so you need some system that is able to adapt automatically and detect them set of expression and adjust the microscope in real time. Similarly, if you have, for example, a region of the sample where there are no cells, you cannot adjust the imaging parameters for that region in advance. You again need a microscope capable of doing that on its own. So this is the way the microscope is laid out. So you, as I explained before, you have two detection objectives that look at the sample, two elimination objectives that create a sheet of light throughout the sample. Um, by doing so, you have essentially a complete view of the sample, but you also have, because of the variety of, of parameters that you have here to adjust all these positions, you have a lot of parameters to adjust, right? So you have the, the, the position of the detection objectives, the position of the illumination objectives, the angles to, that control the geometry of the, of the light sheets. And so that gets very complicated. And we have a theory, I will not go into the details, but we have a theory that tells us how to optimize all these different parameters for different depths and different colors and how they're related to, it, to one another because, of course, you cannot uh, turn these knobs independently. You have to understand their relationships. And we have also uh, uh, some uh, both hardware and software strategies to, to make measurements that, let, that tell us how to adjust these knobs and how to, to optimize the microscope. Um, every few minutes. So let's have a look at the micro zoom in action. Uh, and just before I go into some of the other videos, I'd like to show something I recorded actually with my phone uh, uh, on, on one of the latest microscopes that, that we designed in, when I was still in Dresden at the Max Planck Institute um, uh, of Cell Biology and Genetics. Uh, this, this is basically uh, what you've seen before. This is a Drosophila embryo, but now uh, this is rotated on the screen computationally, and this is actually being recorded in real time as, as I'm filming this, the, the screen. And uh, in this latest kind of iteration of our software, we, we can actually, uh, uh, it's a light sheet microscope that actually has, that version has like two cameras, but also four light sheets. So it's a total of eight views. So it's five gigabytes that are acquired every 30 seconds. Um, and we, uh, we have a GPU-based uh, uh, registration and fusion algorithm that runs in real time. And that basically um, alleviates the problem that, I mean, in a traditional, traditional setup, you would have to save that on the disk. You will have to save all the views on the disk and then fuse that later on. And this could take days to actually do. Uh, we can do that instantly and visualize that also instantly. So what that means is we have eight times less data to store on the disk, which uh, actually makes the, the imaging actually possible because the hard drives are, are not fast enough to, to save that in the first place. Um, so the adaptivity of the microscope, as I was explaining, knows the kind of beautiful resolution throughout the entire system uh, as it's uh, unfolding and developing and as morphogenesis, morphogenesis progresses. And we have uh, interesting phenomena where sometimes you see correlations between certain events and certain variations of the parameters that are being ad adapted. So we can really see uh, that the microscope is adjusting itself as, as different morphogenetic movements happen. 
Um, you can see there's you know, big variations of the parameters required over space and, and significant variations over time also. Um, that makes, of course, uh, uh, without these corrections, of course, the image quality would be f uh, much different. Um, and this is exemplified here. Uh, if we turn off the correction, uh, you, have, uh, you have this image quality, which over time clearly degrades relative to the, to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the corrected image, image quality. So you can see clearly that at the end, uh, you cannot follow the cells anymore. Uh, it's all blurry. And this is true over throughout the, the, the for different regions of the embryo. And for another sample, which is here, a zebrafish embryo and ongoing epipoli, where, the, where you see the cells nicely pro propagating, <coughs> migrating throughout the migrating, <coughs> migrating throughout the, the embryo, you can also see here that there's a, um, a dramatic decreasing decrease in the image quality that uh, that clearly. Um, would be detrimental for any post-processing or analysis of this data. And thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so in the case of a multicolor recording where we label in blue the nuclei and in, in orange here the, the, the CNS, the central neural system of the fly, uh, you can't, this, the microscope cannot adjust itself at the very beginning. There's no signal to adjust against for that channel. But as time progresses, the system detects the presence of, of signal and adjusts itself. And the quality then of the images is such that we can really resolve the processes, which is kind of what we, what we want to see here. Um, and so, so I kind of showed you here how the hardware and the software can, can, can push the limits of resolution. But um, we have recently uh, pushed also the, 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 the image quality further using uh, machine learning. Um, and, and this comes from a simple fact and, and, and problem really, really in microscopy is that ideally we would like to maximize all these quantities and we would like to have uh, you know, highly contrasted and, and, and very low noise and we would, have to, we would like to be very gentle to the sample and image for very long and, and we would like to have a higher spatial resolution and very rapid temporal sampling. But the problem is that we can't have all of these things at the same time. Most of the time, we have to make trade-offs. We have to pay some for something with something else. So we have to exchange maybe spatial for temporal resolution. Or uh, if we want to be very gentle to the sample, we might lose uh, our signal-to-noise ratio. And this is true for, for many, many such combinations. So the question is, how do we, how do we go about uh, uh, having not to do these trade-offs? And so this is really the work of Martin Weigert here, who's a PhD student in the lab of Jean Myers uh, in, in Dresden, where I was doing my postdoc. And this has been a very successful project. Let me show you what has been done there. Um, when you try to image a sample like the planaria, it has a tendency to uh, not like light. So it will twitch incessantly as soon as you try to image it uh, with a normal high, la you know, with a sufficient amount of laser power so that you can actually can see the, the nuclei clearly and, and with sharpness. The problem is if you do that, if, if they twitch, then they, they move and there's motion blur. So you have maybe uh, sharp images, but they're highly uh, uh, blurred through motion. If you try to do the opposite, if you reduce the laser power and uh, uh, you you have much less twitching, as you can see. But then there is uh, the problem that the Im each individual image, maybe there's no motion blur anymore, but then they are not sharp anymore. There's the, because you have little light coming out, you have also very, very little signal um, to noise ratio. And so that, that makes it also difficult to, to use these images. So how do we actually get both uh, advantages? Uh, how do we get uh, sharp images? Uh, uh, with uh, uh, non-motion blurred and with high signal-to-noise ratio. So we used uh, something that has been used by, by many already, like I, I, in previous talk mentioned these deep convolutional networks. Uh, one interesting thing is that this, this is really like, a, this is a new technology or a new, a new, a new principle of, uh, of machine learning that's been spreading throughout uh, the whole scientific uh, realm. Um, and one fabulous example was how, how this was used by DeepMind to beat 
uh, the, the human players at Go, the best human players in the world at Go. And, and one key thing of, of these deep co convolutional ne neural networks is that they can, they can do a processing that is very akin to what the retina or the brain does. And in some sense, the reason why probably they could explore, the, uh, uh, they could beat uh, uh, really humans is that instead of, uh, of uh, using brute force as it was done for to, to beat humans at, uh, at chess, uh, in this case, really, uh, the whole image, uh, in some sense, of the board is looked at and processed in a, in a way that is, not, uh, uh, that, that is very akin to, to, to a form of artificial intuition, if you want. So, and so this is a very powerful uh, concept. And so these deep convolutional neural networks uh, have been shown to be incredibly powerful at analyzing images. And so we ask ourselves the question, uh, can we use that to improve the quality of the images coming out of the microscopes? And so to be able to do that, you, uh, I mean, as, as in many cases in machine learning, you have to provide examples. Um, and so what we did is we provided examples of the low and high quality images. The high quality images we, we get essentially by uh, fixing, killing the sample, fixing it, taking images at low and high le levels of light, then we can obtain these pairs of images on a dead sample that cannot move by definition of death, right? So uh, that is the trick. Uh, because we use these pairs uh, to then train a network that will uh, basically know how to uh, 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 turn uh, uh, low quality images into high quality images. So the, the key thing is to obtain these pairs of images, right? And so obtaining these pairs of images, uh, you can do it by experiments as I just described, but you also can use simulations that simulate the optics and simulate even sometimes the structure of the samples themselves. So there are many ways of obtaining these pairs of images. Um, in this case, we, we, use, we use an experiment where we, we, we fix the samples. Um, and if we do that, we learn a network that will then uh, uh, learn to invert, if you wish, the, 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 the natural process of imaging, which is to go from the true signal to what is observed. And we can invert that and find the restored signal, the, the image that we want to have uh, uh, from the image that we actually obtain from the microscope. If we do that, then the quality of the images is dramatically improved and there's no blur. There's no motion blur. So now we have both uh, high contrasted and, uh, uh, um, and, and unblurred images. Um, so if we look at the same uh, process but in, in 3D, we can see, okay, very low signal to noise ratio here. Uh, poor, poor quality of images that will probably not lead to any uh, you know, uh, significant uh, uh, processing. I mean, it's difficult to analyze these images here, but then after applying the neural network, we get images that are highly contrasted and, and, and quite beautiful. And we do that having imaged with 60 times less light total. So it's a combination of, of, uh, of reducing the exposure and reducing the, the laser power. So the dosage is, is reduced. The same trick can be applied. So that's the beauty of machine learning is that you can design one machine that learns, one algorithm that learns, and then apply it to a different problem as long as you can find pairs of images that will allow you to train the network. So here we train a new network to instead of uh, 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 reducing noise in images, we train it to, uh, if you want, deconvolve uh, these 3D images so that we have uh, isotropic resolution. Uh, the microscopes, um, almost every microscope requires images that are anisotropic along what's called the axial direction, the Z direction, um, and we can solve that. Uh, here, of course, that means that we, in this case, we multiply by five the size of the, of the data sets. So the same data set that I showed you before uh, would be five times bigger, so we're talking about five terabytes once we process this. Uh, so again, a, a big challenge. Uh, finally, um, if you, again, you can play the same trick, but with a different problem, the same uh, machinery, exact same network architecture, but a different problem. In this case, we push everything to the limit in the sense that we simulate, we, use, we produce training data by simulating microtubule structures. So we, 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 make artificially, uh, 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 we make artificial images of microtubules and granules. We simulate the optics, we obtain the pairs of images that way, and then we apply that on wide field images and we obtain uh, something akin to super-resolved super um, uh, images. In some sense, it's, it's really just a, a form of very well-informed deconvolution 
Um, uh, I'm not sure that, I mean, super resolution is slightly pushing it, but um, definitely we deconvolve in an in a, in a intelligent manner with a prior knowledge of what is, what we know is in the sample. Okay, so the, the, I'd like to, to conclude by, of course, thanking uh, and acknowledging all the people that have been uh, part of all, all the work I've presented. Uh, I'd like to um, particularly uh, mention uh, Phil Keller, uh, and Jean Myers, who are my two mentors from my postdoc time. So I started a, a year ago at the Biohub, my, my own lab, and, and they were really intru instrumental to, to make that possible. And on the autopilot project, I think the, the, two, the two key people I'd like to acknowledge is uh, um, um, Bill Lemon and Raghav Chetri. Uh, on the uh, CARE project, uh, Martin Weigert and Florian Hugh. Uh, uh, especially, uh, I, I must say, Flor uh, uh, Florian and, and did a great job at, uh, at managing the project. And uh, Martin did an amazing, amazing, amazing work with the, with the, you know, the developing the technology and the, and the science for this. Um, and then everybody else at the at the Max Planck Institute, and also, um, of course, my colleagues at the Biohub, where I started a year ago, my own lab. It's been a great, great time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Joel Zisman, Director of Advanced Computing for University of Miami. You mentioned about the size of the data exploding when you ran your convoluted neural networks on it. How much processing time did this take? You, the f processing time for? The uh, Nilanagaster uh, uh, deep learning network. Was it a significant For, uh, amount of time? It, it, it's, I think by now it's, uh, it should be possible to do that in real time. In real time, yeah. in real time with uh, what kind of computational resources? You need the latest graphics card and you need to slightly optimize the networks by using some tricks. <laughs> I'd like to I'll ask a question. Um, so you said you train networks based on a ground truth that you then try and invert signal for. How do you assess what the limits of that network are? Um, and when you need to retrain, like how, how do you know what the, the, the boundary space of yeah, utility the, of that is? The boundary is? space of what, what it can be applied to, that's, that's a big challenge. I think it's still, I would say, an open question how, 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 how to estimate how far they, they, they generalize, how to make sure that that the network's predictions are, uh, can be trusted, how to quantify that, how to estimate that. Um, so in the paper we have some estimation, some, some, some approach, but it's, it's still very much, uh, uh, I think, an area of research that, that's gonna be very important for applying this to, to actually uh, come up with scientific discoveries. Um, so that's still open, yeah. So for now, given the resources you have, you can afford to retrain frequently um, but for those who are consuming the networks that maybe you're producing, it's, oh well, it's, I would <laughs> not. I, I think I think the networks have to be always be trained. I mean, it's always like you always have to apply to your own data. You have to train on your own data. You cannot use someone else's. You know, it's like uh, it's like bringing someone who has no experience of, of your data and ask that person to analyze the data. You know, if the person has never seen your data, they can't. They can't have the, you know, your grad student is going to have much more insights about the, the data. So it's a bit the same thing. You, you want to bring the, you want to retrain uh, these algorithms to your own data. Otherwise, that doesn't work. So, so we're not at the point yet where a standard network is going to ship with the no, microscope no. and, and well, everyone will use it. <laughs> you can be lucky, but it's, you can be lucky and it might work. Actually, it's, it works more often than then one could fear but that it would not work, but it's actually is still pretty risky to do so, I would say. I think uh, the safest path is to, is to retrain on your own data. Yeah. So I have a question along a similar lines. How much sort of time do you spend picking what's the most appropriate uh, type of neural network and so on for, for this type of imaging, or did you just pick one and just go with it or <laughs> there's uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed of how much variation we can introduce and still very still get very reasonable results it's pretty amazing actually uh, um, so they, 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 you, you can make mistakes but and then they want to learn but it's once you have understood the kind of three four things you, you, that you have to 
to, to make sure that are present there or the, the key if, as long as the key ingredients are there that you have a lot of freedom and sometimes it just doesn't make so much difference uh, in the end uh, in terms of the quality of the result um, they're extremely versatile and robust to my, in my experience pretty amazing yeah. so as long as you know the the right three or four or however many parameters that it yeah really there are a few about, things you have to if know that's there yeah, yeah. it's fairly stable to the type of network you use or other uh, yeah, approaches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sergey Sorkin, uh, 3i. We, we kind of work on a similar, similar technology. I was just curious how much uh, you find the balance between software methodologies and hardware and what kind of light sheets you are using, whether it's just typical SPIM, Gaussian, or if you've tried other uh, patterning Interesting methods like that. Yeah, so, so now the BiHub, we are, we, we are building our own uh, legend microscope. It's nearly done now. Um, it's essentially a, a very similar to what I showed here. Uh, we're going to you know, make some innovations here and there. But um, yeah, it's basically a standard. Right now, I mean, the version 0, if you want, is a standard for, for lens light sheet. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we have our first coffee break, so please um, ask the speakers the hard questions. <laughs> and uh, we'll pick up in about a half hour.